If you'll uh, turn with me in your Bibles, Luke 24 is where we're going to spend most of our time today. We'll reference a couple things in the Old Testament, but I'll, I'll read those to you also. But uh, Luke 24, if you have a Bible, if you don't, that's totally fine. Uh, you will not be lost. We good? I hear pages turning. Everyone there? Amen? Uh, one. <laughs> we'll start at one. Okay. So Easter Sunday, like I said, this is, I've been trying to narrow it down, and I, I, I was talking to a couple of people last week, and I said, I have like six sermons for Easter Sunday, so we can either just be here for like three hours, or I can just give one, so I narrowed it down to just this one, and I was going to focus just on Old Testament stuff, but um, the Lord just put this on my heart, so here we go. Jesus is, is, is dead in the story. That's where we're at at this point. He was just buried, and the women had followed to the tomb to see where Jesus was buried and how he was buried, and just so they could get some information because they wanted to come back with, with spices and, and and just anoint the body uh, later. So they did that, and that's where we're at here. It says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the, of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful, sinful men and crucified and on the third day rise? And so Jesus had said this several times to his disciples. It shouldn't have been any surprise, but they couldn't even comprehend while they were talking to Jesus that, you know, how could someone die and then come back to life? Like, that doesn't even make sense, does it? I mean, in, even in our, our modern, how many of you have ever seen that happen? Anybody? I've, I've never seen that happen. Maybe there's some paramedics. I'm surprised Fred hasn't seen that happen. Fred and Lori have seen, okay. So it happens in the medical field, but it's not like an everyday occurrence. Like when our family members die, they, they normally, they're normally dead. And um, so they weren't even comprehending it when Jesus said that. And he talked a lot in parables. Maybe they thought, you know, maybe this is just a parable. Maybe it means something else. But uh, now it's happening. And they remembered his words, the women did. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. So here's lesson one for today. Oh. Maybe. Okay, lesson one, listen to the godly women in your lives, all right? <laughs> and I meant this kind of as a joke, but at the same token, this is not a joke. It really seems that as far as God terms, okay, women seem to be more spiritually in tune than men are. And I don't mean anything against the men that way, but even um, just for example in my life, my wife generally knows when something is wrong in the spirit before I do. And she'll tell me, and a lot of times in the beginning of our relationship, I'd be like, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> whatever. And um, she's pretty much always right <laughs> when it comes to that kind of stuff. And these women, they, they remembered the words of Jesus before even the apostles did. And he, he told the apostles explicitly several times over, I'm going to die three days later, I'm going to rise again. But the women, who are maybe on the outside of the circle, who maybe heard it from across the room, as they're, as they're known to do, they got it. They got it, and they picked it up immediately. So that's the first lesson here today. Listen to the godly women in your lives. Because if they would have just listened here, they could have saved themselves a, a little bit of grief, couldn't they? Because they were agonizing over the death of Jesus. They were still really struggling with this. And Peter goes out, and, and it says in another place that John went out also 
Uh, and they went to the tomb, and, and they didn't find the body of Jesus either. But now we get to the road in Emmaus, and we're verse 13 here. The road to Emmaus. That's where, where I really wanted to spend our time today. It says that very day, two of them, and when it says them, it means two of the disciples of Jesus. This isn't two of the eleven apostles that are left, but two of the disciples of Jesus went down the road um, to Emmaus. It was a town seven miles away. And um, as they were talking to each other about the things that had happened, <coughs> oh, sorry, and they were talking about, to each other about the things that had happened, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So Jesus now, resurrected Christ, walks up and starts walking with them down the road. How cool is that? And Jesus said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know about the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all, thing, all these things, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us when they went to the tomb early in the morning, and they did not find his body. They came back saying they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. So these guys, they had heard this testimony of the women. They had heard Jesus preaching the entire time. And still, they were just going home. They, were just, they had followed Jesus in ministry and they, they packed their bags and they're out of here. They're going back. And they're going to stop at this town of Emmaus on the way, um, on their way home. And that's, uh, that's amazing, isn't it? I mean, we don't know exactly how long they followed, followed Jesus. I mean, they could have just been in, in, the, in the city for the Passover feast or, or something, but it seems, it sure seems like they follow him for some time, doesn't it? When it says that we, had, we really had hope that this prophet was the one, that he was the Messiah. <laughs> and then Jesus comes back and says, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things, and enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus says, you guys, haven't you read anything? Hey, didn't, you, didn't you, I mean, he can't say explicitly, didn't you listen to what I told you all these years? But that he could have said that. Because Jesus had gone through a lot of these different scriptures with them. A lot of the different Old Testament prophecies and, and showed how he was the fulfillment. You guys remember that? When he was in the temple teaching, and he said, this very day, this very day, the prophecies are fulfilled. And, and that happened constantly. But what, what do you think he talked to them about? Because I went through, and I was just thinking about this. Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So I went back and I just started to look. You know, what are the things concerning Jesus? And he said he began with Moses. So I'm going back. You know, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So I, just, I was looking in Genesis. And we have in there just right after the first sin. Right after the very first sin in the garden. Eve eats the apple. She gives it to Adam. Adam Eve eats the apple. And sin. The fall of man, right? We all, we all know that story. We've all heard that story before. And immediately after they eat it, they feel shame. They know that they've done something wrong. And they make, they make leaves for themselves to cover themselves because they're ashamed of their nakedness for the first time. And I was looking back, and I was looking at verse 21 in, in Genesis 4, and it says this, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So they had already made this clothing out of leaves, but God made clothing of skins. And I really believe that this was God showing that blood is required. That there must be blood to cover sin. Because if that wasn't the case, then God would have just killed them right then, wouldn't he? 
I mean, the, the, the wages of sin is death. So the very first sin, that's what, that's what they deserved, was death, to die right then. But God, he sacrifices, I'm assuming, animals on their behalf, makes clothing for them on their behalf, and covers their nakedness in the, in the proper way. And we can even see that in Cain and Abel. You remember Abel's sacrifice was an animal, and it was the proper sacrifice. And uh, Cain brought fruit of the land as his sacrifice, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't sufficient. And we know how that story turned out. So this, maybe he was talking about that. Maybe that's what Jesus was explaining to them as they walked along the road. You know, they had seven miles. They had a lot of time to talk. Um, yeah, you know, maybe he went through this and said, even from the beginning, blood needed to be poured out. We've had this system of sacrifices for so long, and when the Messiah came, it would be his blood that would be the final shedding and forgiveness of sin. Maybe that's what it was. I, lo- I looked a little further. I said, maybe, maybe it was Genesis 22. Maybe that's what Jesus was telling him about, and it's the sacrifice of Isaac. You guys know that story? There was a man in the Old Testament named Abraham. He was the father of, of the Jewish nation. Um, the father, really, of, of all three major world religions at this point. Um, legitimate father of two and um, illegitimate father of one uh, in, in, in Islam, in, in Muslim nation. And, um, but here we see this story of him. And he had... God had promised him a son, and for years and years he had waited and waited, and he's a hundred years old, and his wife is not too far behind him, and God has still promised them this son, that they would have a son. And lo and behold, old age, way past the possibility of having a child, Sarah gets pregnant, and she has Isaac. And then we see what God asks him to do. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here am I. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. And a burnt offering was literally, you would kill the animal, put it on the altar, and burn it as a sacrifice to the Lord. And this was the son that God had promised him. The only son. The only legitimate son that Abraham had. The one who would, many nations would come out of the sun. And God asks him to sacrifice him. Can you fathom that? I mean, if if God came to me and said, your oldest daughter, Abigail, take her and sacrifice her. There's not strength in me to do that. Not even close. There's no way that I could do that. And yet Abraham, faithful, walks to the mountain, puts him on the altar, ties him up, puts him on the altar on top of the wood, raises his knife, is about to come down, and it says the angel of the Lord. And whenever it says the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, you can, you can know that that's Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord says, don't lay a hand on him. Abraham, Abraham, stop. Don't lay a hand on the boy. And I'm thinking maybe Jesus was walking down the road telling him the story about Abraham. You know, maybe he said that was a representation. Because when it's amazing if you read this story, Abraham straps the wood to the Isaac's back and they go up the mountain. Now who does that remind you of? Jesus with the cross, right? The wood on his back that he'll be sacrificed on going up the mountain. And maybe Jesus is pointing out all these things in the story and he says, but, but God, but God stopped Abraham because that sacrifice wasn't going to be necessary. This was a representation for what was to come. This was a representation for the great sacrifice that the Messiah would make on your behalf. The blood poured out on your behalf. Maybe that's what they were talking about. Maybe they were talking about Exodus 12. Exodus 12 is a story of the Passover. It's what they had just gone through. That, that was the, the Passover was the time of, of Easter. Um, when, we, when we celebrate um, the, the Saturday before Easter is the, is the Sabbath. 
and the Passover generally will fall within a, a few day period of, of Easter. And that's why we celebrate Easter on the day that we do. I forget what it actually is. It's the first Saturday after the first full moon of the spring equinox. It's like some really goofy thing on how they figure it out, but that's way, I shouldn't say goofy thing. It's the God-given thing, the way that we figure it out. Um, but it's goofy in our uh, American understanding of time. But that's how they figure it out, and that's why Easter falls at a different time every year. But the, this specific Passover, Egypt had been in captivity, the very first Passover, for over 400 years. They were slaves to the Egyptians. And it says this, they, you remember all the plagues in Egypt? God had been just plague after plague he was giving through Moses uh, to, to try to free his people Israel so they could go into the promised land. We have the plague of frogs, gnats, flies, all the livestock die, boils, hail, all of these different things, horrible things that you and I can't even imagine. Um, you know, people complain about living in Catanning, but Catanning is a paradise compared to Egypt during the plagues, okay? Catanning is a great place. Catanning is a great place. But we come to this final plague, and God just says once and for all, this is going to be the last one. <clears throat> At about midnight, God says, I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. So at that point, Moses and Aaron kind of, if, if, if God just stopped talking right there, that would have really freaked them out, right? Because the, it's all the Egyptians, but he also says the firstborn of all the slave girls. Well, gosh, that's Israel. Israel's full of slave girls. A lot of them are firstborn sons of slave girls. Like, that's not, that's not good if you're in Egypt at that time. But God then says this, But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes distinction between Egypt and Israel. So God says, I'm going to protect Israel. Do you remember how he did it? Every family had to go find a perfect lamb, a perfect lamb that they could sacrifice. And they, they killed it, took the blood, and spread it on the doorposts of their houses. And when the Spirit of the Lord went through Egypt and killed all the firstborn children, He passed over every house that was marked with the blood of the Lamb. Every house that was marked with the blood of the Lamb. And maybe this is what Jesus was telling them. Maybe He says, remember that first Passover, how we celebrated the blood on the doorposts, and the blood of the Lamb covers all sin. It covers, and death is defeated by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Death is defeated by the blood of the Lamb. Maybe He's telling them this and saying, this sacrifice, this sacrifice is the blood once and for all. And we see not only was death defeated, all the firstborn children lived, but, but what else happened? Immediately after. I mean, it's not, even, it's not even the next morning. Pharaoh doesn't even wait till the morning. He calls Moses and Aaron at night, and they come to him and he says, get out of here. <laughs> we don't want you here anymore. I'm tired of these plagues. And we, they're, they're trying to save the rest of the people. And they said, get out. Get out. The people are free. 400 years in captivity. And they're free in one night. Because death is defeated. Death is defeated. Amen? Maybe this is what Jesus was talking to them about as they walked down the road. I could go on, guys. I looked up last night, there's over 300 references in the Old Testament to the Messiah, all fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And like I said, he had seven miles to walk. Maybe, maybe they went through all of them. You know, maybe Jesus just talked really, really fast and, and went through all 300 references. But they still didn't quite get it. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, it says. In Luke 24. This is my second lesson for you. You can know the whole Bible. You can know every messianic prophecy there is to know about Jesus. 
and you can still not recognize the Savior. Isn't that crazy? I mean, these guys followed. They walked with Jesus. And they were, as soon as he died, they were out. And Jesus meets them on the road and speaks to them all the things concerning himself, all the things that they watched before their very eyes be fulfilled. And they still had missed it up to this point. But there's good news. They drew near to the village to which they were going, I'm assuming Emmaus. And Jesus acted as if he was just going to go further, that he wasn't done walking for the night. So it's evening, they've been walking for quite a while now, seven miles. And they go, okay, this is where we're at. And Jesus goes, okay, see you guys later. Just casually, he's going to go away. And they say, what? They urged him strongly, saying, stay with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him. Finally and he vanished from their sight. So finally, they sit down at the table and break bread with Jesus, and all of a sudden, it's like they all recognize, finally, this is him. This is the, he really is risen. This is the Messiah. This is Jesus who we've been following. This is the one who all the Old Testament prophecies pointed to. All the things he told us on the road were true. This is him. This is him. They finally realize it. Is there something burning inside your heart today, you guys? Is there something burning inside your heart? Because this is what happened to me, okay? I was raised Catholic, and nothing against Catholicism, okay? I've, I've been on that soapbox before, but that, this isn't that story, okay? I was raised Catholic, and I was raised knowing all the Bible stories, okay? We talked about all the Bible stories. I went to church faithfully every week, Sunday school every week. And you know what? It didn't didn't do anything for me. I came to be a teenager, and I, I was still went off on my own way. I went out, and I partied, and I drank, and I did drugs, and I did all the things that you're not supposed to do. And that was my life. Even though, in my mind, I knew all the stories, I knew that Jesus had come, I knew that Jesus had died for the forgiveness of the world, I could recite all the prayers, I could do all the things that you're supposed to do in church, I could put on my nice clothes, I could show up, and people would think, wow, that's a nice young man. Very put together. And he's financially successful, and and I wish my kid was like him. I mean, I, actually, I've heard people say that about me as I was growing up. And I'm doing all of the, and I'm thinking, you do not wish your kid was like me. <laughs> I pray my kids are not like me. <laughs> you do not want your kids to be like me. Maybe now, but not, not then. <laughs> not then, certainly. But this is the truth. I knew all the stories, and I still didn't recognize Jesus. But one day... I began to change, okay? I began to change. Something began to burn within my heart. Something began to burn within me that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Savior, that Jesus is the Messiah. And it went from here to here. It's just a short transfer. They say 13 inches is the change that needs to be required for someone to be saved. 13 inches to get the information from your head to your heart. And that's what happened to me. This is the two things that these guys did. We look at the text again. As Jesus was talking to them, they were recognizing that something was different. God was beginning to work in their hearts as Jesus went through all of these Old Testament prophecies all of these different things, pointing to himself, pointing to uh, the sacrifice that he had given for you and for me. And something began to burn in their hearts. So they said, turn, come in with us. It's late. You don't want to be walking out by yourself. What were they really trying to do? Just get more time with him. Just get more time with him. So they invited him in 
and then they communed with him. There was something special about that communion together, okay? They broke bread together. They had communion. So today, I picked up some real bread yesterday, a little bit bigger than the normal little pieces of bread that we, that we have. And I did that because I just want us to commune with him today. Is there some, do you guys feel something in your heart when I go through these Old Testament stories that talk about Jesus? Do you feel the same thing that I feel? Do you feel that that was too, uh, it's like 3,000 years of human history here in this book? Abraham was thousands of years before Jesus. And that story of him sacrificing his only son is the story of God sacrificing his only son. 2,000 years ago. It's the same story. Is that not amazing to you? That Passover story of God passing over sin, sparing people because of the blood of the Lamb. That's what He's done for you and for me. When He died on that cross, when He poured out His blood for you and for me, He spares us from the consequences of our sins. If we will just accept Him. If we will just invite Him into our lives as Savior and as Lord, everything can change. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, we have one final song that we're going to sing. And um, we're not going to have like a traditional communion where we go through the Word and, and then you eat the bread when we say to eat the bread and you drink the grape juice when we say to drink the grape juice. And I want today to be deeper than that. Because it should be deeper than that. This communion is something that it should be meaningful every time that we do it. It should be something that cuts right to the heart every time that we do it. Because when we take communion, we're remembering the body, right? The bread represents the body of Christ. The body of Christ broken for you and for me. The body of Christ that was whipped, beaten, spit on, that the nails went through the hands, the nails went through the feet. That body that was physically destroyed for you and for me. And even more than that, the, the, the holy wrath of God that came down for you and for me upon Jesus Christ. The wrath that you and I deserve. And when we drink this juice, it's representative of the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood that was poured out for you and for me. That blood on the doorpost that allows God to pass over us. It's amazing, guys. Over 300 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled on that very day. So as we, as we get ready to sing, I, I just want to ask you, where are you at in your life? Are you like these guys? They were seeking something. They didn't even know what it was at the time. They were waiting for the Messiah to come, but I really don't think they understood, well, they obviously didn't understand what exactly the Messiah was going to be like. But they were searching. They followed Jesus for some time. <clears throat> they were searching. And then when he died, it seemed like it all was gone. And that's how it can feel like for you and me sometimes. I feel like our lives are just going out of control, that we're searching, we're searching for something, but it just, it just died. And it feels like it's all over. But I want to let you know that it's not all over. That Jesus rose then, and the joy that those men had on that day when they realized that Jesus is risen. This is the Messiah. Jesus is still alive today, you guys. Jesus is still alive and working in this community. He's still alive working in this world. He's still alive working in you and me. And it's not too late. If you've lived your life apart from God, and something is burning in your heart today, as you eat this bread and take this 
this wine, invite Him in and commune with Him. Because it's in that face-to-face interaction with Jesus that everything changes. At that point, everything changes. You've got to take it from your heart or from your head to your heart. And when you open your heart and invite Him in as, G- as Lord and Savior, he is, he is mighty to save. He is faithful to His Word that He will come in and He will change you and He will make you into the person that God wants you to be. But most of all, He'll wash away your sins. You can be forgiven. You can go to heaven in eternity. Amen? Amen. So, I know some of you have taken the communion already, and that's totally fine. As we go through this song, I want you to just talk to Him. Commune with Him. And eat, eat the bread and drink the wine at your leisure. <clears throat> The last couple of verses here. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. These guys, I feel like I need to stand up here. I'm getting tall people. (laughs) These guys, they had communed with Jesus. They had met with Him now face to face. And they were changed forever. And immediately, it wasn't something where it says, a month later after they had, you know, read the Bible four times and and, and been super spiritual and, and prayed. It says, immediately, They rose and returned to Jerusalem. They didn't care that it was evening. They probably went back ten times faster than they came, the seven miles. And they found the eleven, the apostles, those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. You guys, this is the last step. We invite Him in. We commune with Him. But then we have a job to do. We have to go out and tell, tell people what happened. Tell people what God has done in your life. Tell people how God met you in church today. Tell people how it was so different today. About the Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled in Easter. Tell them about how the bunny and the eggs are junk. And that the cross is what Easter is all about. Don't let this stuff leave your heart as you walk out these doors today. Okay? I'm just going to pray for all of us. Father, I pray for every single person here. That the words that have been spoken in the service, that the, the, the songs that have been sung, God, that you would just plant them deep inside our hearts. That you would plant the prophecies of the Old Testament into our hearts. That we would be able to tell people how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of history. Everything that we've been waiting for, if we have questions in our lives, He is the answer. If we have problems in our lives, He is the solution. Father, I pray for those here that don't know You, that don't have a relationship with You, that they would continue this communion with You, God. That they would continue this face-to-face meeting, whether it's through prayer or through reading Your Word or through coming to church, God. However, You're going to take this information from their minds to their hearts, God. I just pray that you'd be with them in that process. That they would invite you in, that they would commune with you, and that they would be changed forever, speaking to everyone they see about all that you've done and all that you are. We thank you so much, God, for your son this weekend. For not only his death on the cross, but his resurrection, God. Because without the resurrection, then it was all worthless. A dead Savior is not a good Savior at all. But our Savior is alive. And we thank you so much for that. That that He's alive working in this church. That He's alive working in these people, God. That He's alive working in me. God, continue to change us. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen.